Pearson Ravitz story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate OBGYN at the height of her career. But when a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery, her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Dr. Pearson became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Ravitz, Dr. Pearson founded Pearson Ravitz, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Ravitz serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Ravitz, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician founded and physician focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRavitz.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Ravitz advisor. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. How is AI going to make our patients healthier, save the healthcare system money, and make us more accurate diagnosticians? Stay tuned to find out. Dr. Michael Byrne, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much, Brad, for the invitation. So tell us a little about your practice and then you know, dovetail that into Satisfy Health. I am technically speaking a practicing GI physician, a gastroenterologist here in Vancouver. So at the main hospital, Vancouver General and the university. My colleagues will tell you these days, they, they will probably say, who's Mike rather than worse, Mike, because I spend most of my time now running Satisfy Health, but I still like to keep relevant and in the field. So when I do go to work, I do a lot of interventional endoscopy. So surgical endoscopy, pancreas work, that kind of stuff, which is great. But I now get to follow my major passion these days, which is AI in the medical field. Okay. So Satisfy is spelled Satisfai, Satisfy. So tell us about that. So I started the company, I think in 2015. So what's that? Eight years now. And my aims, my hopes were to bring AI solutions to what I do every day, which is endoscopy. So all the visuals of looking at things in real time, disease, cancers, inflammatory diseases, and try and improve on you know the weaknesses, the limitations of the human eye and the human brain. So we started out looking at polyps, colon polyps, which are very common, as you know, in colon screening for cancer, and looking at ways to improve how we look at them and find them and interrogate them. You know, the company has grown arms and legs since with a whole bunch of things that I'm sure we'll get into. But that was the genesis about bringing AI solutions to -to day-to-day practice and making practical work tools and helping us do what we do better rather than threaten us. As it's gone along, I've taken more and more time away from work, and now I'm pretty much full-time at this company, at this desk. For the listeners who aren't, I mean, at this point in the age of chat GPT and the rest of it, people are getting more and more familiar with AI is, or at least what they perceive it to be. So from someone who's an expert in the field, just give us a basic working definition of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So they're often used interchangeably. And in many ways, I think when people use it in day-to-day parlance, they mean the same thing. AI is pretty much an umbrella term. It's like a, it's a hierarchy and it's the overarching term for a broader concept of enabling a machine or a system to sense or to reason or to act or to adapt like a human. Whereas machine learning is an application of AI within that AI ecosystem that allows machines to to extract knowledge from data and to learn from it autonomously. And I think later we might talk about some of the AI stuff in my field. And there's another field related to that called computer vision, which is basically the field of machine learning where you train a machine to learn from data, usually visual data, and give you an interpretation to learn from it and maybe give you some decisions to make around that. So they're very similar terms, but there really is a subset kind of relationship, shall we say. So before we get into like the hard medicine, like how we're using AI in in gastroenterology right now, 
How are you using AI in your life outside of medicine? Like, are you finding that you're using tools since you're so involved in the field that maybe your colleagues might not be familiar with? How, how are you utilizing it outside of the endoscopy suite? So I think I'm using it like most people are using it, which is most of the time we don't actually know we're using it, right? So every time I use my smartphone, there's something going on with AI and we all know how much time we spend on our smartphones every day. Every time I shop online for something personal or related to my work, every time I use a voice assistant, most of us are using something like Siri or Alexa or whatever for our music searches or turn on the lights. We have some stuff in our home here that's AI driven, some lighting systems that we'll learn from the very lucky, I guess, privileged to have that, but that will learn from my choice of ambi ambient light. Every time we go to the airport, we're trusting AI with our security going through, going through passport control. So we're using AI all the time, of course, in our day-to-day -day lives, right? I don't drive a self-driving vehicle. I don't allow a self-driving vehicle to take me to work, but they're out there. So it's pretty ubiquitous already, as we, most of us know. But I think a lot of the time we don't appreciate that it actually is some sort of machine intelligence behind the automation. It's already insinuated itself into aspects of our life without us giving it express permission to do so. Well, that's true. And that's always a comment that I make in relation to when we get into people asking about the trustworthiness of AI in health. And I say it's a big problem and we need to address it. And it's a very big concern. But we trust implicitly or otherwise AI to do many, many of the other important things in our lives on a daily basis. And we don't think twice about it. I would argue that emergency medicine physicians trust ultrasound in a way that a, the previous generation may not have right? They rely on it now more heavily as like an extension of their physical exam. But that exactly that's exactly what it is. It's an extension of their physical exam. So in this situation, it sounds like it's an extension of the physician. It hasn't replaced the physician. You're not going to an autonomous robotic physician. You're going to a physician who's using it as a tool to improve detection and improve their efficiency and be able to take care of more patients in a better way. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly for the very foreseeable future and hopefully in the longer term, you know, it's about AI, if you want to call it that, and physician or healthcare professional in perfect harmony rather than one against the other, right? It's working together. It's taking away some of the pain from what we do, making some inefficiencies less inefficient, improving accuracies, helping us with decisions. In some cases, replacing some of the stuff that we do, but freeing us up to do other stuff. So it is an enabler. It is a support tool. But there are concerns or sensitivities around, you know, truly diagnostic decision making that machines can and likely will make. But yes, I think your point about this being something that enables us, like your ultrasound analogy is very important for people like us in the healthcare profession to understand and our patients and others to realize as well. Let's get into it then. You started off using it to try to help with colon biopsy. Do you mean help you identify polyps that you may be missing or identify polyps that you should or shouldn't be biopsying? How did you use it in that setting? Yeah, both us and others have done this. So for example, I'll give you a metric the major polyps that are of concern are called adenomas. Those are the ones that can be potentially cancerous and lead to colon cancer. We want to remove those if we see them. So there's a reflection of that called the ADR or the adenoma detection rate. It's In other words, how many of these precancerous polyps do you pick up? For every 1% increase in that ADR, you will decrease colon cancer mortality by 3%. So nothing to be sniffed at if you even have a small increase in performance. So AI tools undoubtedly for detection can help the doctor find polyps that they miss. And why do they miss them? They miss them often because they're flat, they're covered in something, they're in the corner of the screen. Dare I say doctors are distracted and distractible. They tire, you are running late. You know, these are all true elements of human practice and they mean me miss things. The miss rate for colon polyps may be as high as 20%. So any tool that will make you better and pick up 
3% more is to be encouraged. And most of the AI tools out there will certainly help you maybe increase your polyp detection rate by 8, 10%. That's an amazing increase. Wow. And, you know, we're only starting to see the value of that now. Then to your other point in your question, once you have found the polyp yourself or with the help of a machine, the ability to, for the human eye to look at that polyp and say in real time what it is quite limited. That's called doing an optical biopsy. So looking at something in real time and saying, I think that's an adenoma, I think that's a non-adenoma, so cancerous or not, is tough for the human eye. Experts can do it, but most average endoscopists are not very good at it. So what do we do right now? We take every single polyp off and we send it to the lab. Most of those small polyps, Brad, do not have any cancerous tissue in it. We could make that diagnosis in live time and take, remove the polyp and throw it in the garbage. Saves a bunch of time and a bunch of money, but it's not the current standard. AI can do that so much better, in my opinion, than the average human uh, endoscopist or as good as an expert, shall we say, and allow you to give a live accurate uh, diagnosis and change practice by throwing that polyp in the garbage. So you're saying it's a, it's still an adenoma. I'm not a gastroenterologist, so I'm just a little confused. And not every polyp is an adenoma, but the adenomas are the precancerous ones, but all polyps still need to be removed, even if they're not adenomas? Yeah, that's a debatable one. So here again, so we're talking about small polyps, okay? So many of the polyps in the colon are small, five millimeters or less. Yeah. If it is an adenoma, it needs to be removed but you probably don't need to send it to the lab if you have an accurate live optical biopsy, which AI will facilitate. Got it. And then you can set the surveillance and say, okay, you've had an adenoma, please come back in five years. If you say it's not an adenoma, it's what we call a hyperplastic polyp, which is pretty much a benign polyp, and it's small, I can probably, in theory, leave that in place, or maybe I remove it and throw it in the garbage as well. But I'm setting a different surveillance interval because that patient has a different risk of colon cancer. So I'm already risk stratifying by my ability to do a live biopsy. Right now, I wait for the pathologist to tell me what every single polyp is, and then I set the surveillance interval for that patient based on the guidelines. I could set that surveillance interval today in a patient in whom I've done a scope if I used an accurate live optical biopsy, which AI likely can facilitate. That doesn't really save us very much because you're not telling me a week from now or a month from now that I have to get a polyp, another colonoscopy in a year or three years or five years is going to change. But like the volume of work that the pathologist is going to need to do is going to be greatly decreased if you can just, you know, cut them. Oh, I don't know if the pathologists are going to be <laughs> appreciating this very much, Mike, because now you're cutting them out of the picture. You're taking you're there. There's another specialty who's lost their job. Yeah, well. That's happening across the board, right? That's called advancement in medicine, right? So we all have these turf battles, which are not necessarily for the betterment of health. They're often quite selfish. And, you know, I think the argument to that is it will allow pathologists to look at more relevant disease that needs a more timely diagnosis rather than these diminutive polyps that almost never harbor. So we're talking again, the small things in the colon, they almost never harbor significant cancerous change. It's about pre-cancer and knowing what it is or not. So if you can free up the pathology services to do other more important stuff, great if your initial live biopsy is accurate. And there is a number of, there are a number of studies that suggest in the US system alone, for example, you might save a billion dollars a year by negating the need for a pathologist to look at these boring polyps. And there are doctor shortages down the pike. And so you're just freeing, as you said, you're just freeing them up to do other work. You're not putting them out of a job. There's plenty of work out there for all of us. It's just redistributing that work to free up that time to do other things. Absolutely. There's so many things in what we do, you and I as physicians, that we would love to have done more automatedly that let us do the cooler stuff, the more interesting stuff, and the more empathetic stuff for our patients, way better. So then what's the difference between computer vision and an optical biopsy? So I can do an optical biopsy with my human eye. An optical biopsy is simply looking at something, in my case, with my own eyes, or in a computer vision with the computer's eyes, right? It's simply a interpretation of the live image in front of me. So I'm doing a video colonoscopy. 
So there's a live flowing image on the screen in front of me. I can, if I'm trained enough and I know what I'm looking at, I can do an optical biopsy. The problem is that unless you're a global expert, most people aren't very good. It's a bit, a little bit like looking at a fingerprint and trying to work out if it's my fingerprint or yours. It's not quite that difficult, but it's not, it is challenging for the average endoscopist or the average user, whereas the machine, it's volume, right? The human eye is asked to look for three features on polyps to make an optical biopsy. When experts say to me, how does the machine do better than average doctors? What is it seeing? How can we learn more? I tell them the machine is looking at at least a thousand things per polyp. Things we can't even conceptualize, edges, you know, zeros and ones, it's math. And you can just keep feeding it, feeding it, feeding it more and more and more, and then it gets more and more accurate at it. Whereas us, you know, we hit our limit. How many polyps can you possibly look at? Like flashcards of polyp just flashing across your screen until you just get numb to it. I mean, I picture something like Clockwork Orange where someone's got their eyes taped open and just looking at, we can't and don't want to be doing this when we can rely on the the computers to be doing it. Well, there you see Stanley Kubrick saw the way of the future in colonoscopy, <laughs> whoever knew. And I think the other reassuring factor in this is that if you are using an AI tool, for example, in this optical biopsy space that you're asking about, there's lots of evidence coming to the fore right now that you're not putting the doctor on autopilot where they just drive the scope and don't care about what they're looking at. You actually by proxy are educating the doctor because if they see the machine making a particular call on a particular lesion and they see that time and time and time again, they're actually probably going to get better themselves and have a greater confidence. So it's a hand in glove relationship as far as I'm concerned. Pardon yeah, the pun. No, I, that, no, that makes sense because you're getting at real time reinforcement as opposed to you do the biopsy and then a week later you get the results back you're not getting that real-time reinforcement. You don't remember what it looked like on endoscopy. You're not going to pour over it. But if you're getting that computer-assisted, then you're inevitably going to get better at it as well. That makes a lot of sense in a less mind-numbing way than the Clockwork Orange version. I thought you said you went to a gastroenterologist. You seem to know quite a lot about it. I get stuff. I get stuff. But the other thing that I now love about gastroenterology is the term optical biopsy. Because next time I see my friendly neighborhood dermatologist, you know, they'll be like, I just did 50 optical biopsies today. <laughs> I just looked at, is there, is there like a different CPT code for optical biopsy? That's the whole reimbursement issue. So, you know, you mentioned dermatology, the static imaging spaces. So radiology with all the CT scans and x-rays and MR and dermatology with all the skin lesions they look at all day and pick at all day. Those are the fields that started the whole AI movement in medicine, doing a diagnostic read, you know, of a melanoma or a a different type of skin lesion or a chest x-ray looking for TB or, you know, lung nodules or whatever. Well, no, just there, the fancy term of optical biopsy being applicable to special specialists. Yeah, I just, I looked at someone's mouth lesion today and I did an optical biopsy of it. Like, can I bill for that? Well, fee code. So I think if, when the fee, when the technologies are proven to increase accuracy, and I know in the dermatology, I'm not a dermatologist either, but I just, you know, I know a number of the physicians in this space from an AI perspective, and a lot of the tools out there are amazing for diagnostic accuracy for skin lesions. So if you can show that you can improve the accuracy of the day to day read and take off things that need to be taken off or whatever, then hopefully, Healthcare systems, reimbursement bodies, insurance bodies, whoever it is, sees value and pays for such a tool, whether that be from a fee code. And there are some diagnostic fee codes for radiology from the CMS in the States. I don't know about dermatology. I'm not sure that there is one yet. There are certainly two or three in the radiology space. But this could be great for like rural areas that don't have access to where there's like one dermatologist for 500 miles and the wait time is a few months, right? Like if you could just send a picture of what it is. You got one of these in your hand. Yeah. Then you can get a lot of diagnostic accuracy. You can take a picture of the lesion, of the polyp, of the skin lesion. You can probably have AI on your phone device that will give you an answer. Or it can be sent to a central cloud where the AI can interrogate that lesion and give you an answer you know, in almost real time or certainly the end of the day or whenever you want to batch them. 
My phone does that. Well, I don't have the app. My wife does for plants in our yard. I don't know what plant this is, you know, and there's a tool for that. That's the, you know, it's going to do some incredible things, especially in, it sounds like underserved areas that don't have the access that, that we'd like them to, or that they'd like to have. So yeah, community access would be great. I ha I need to get that app for my shopping with my wife in the grocery store, because I'm not very savvy with two thirds of the vegetables that, that are on the privileged supermarket shelves in Vancouver. But I'm like, and what's that? I've never seen that before. Never even heard of it. I better get the app. Is it ripe or not? And then your phone can tell you. <laughs> I need help with that version of it. So what about predictive models of disease? Helping us determine who does need more frequent colonoscopies or who's going to respond to different agent that have like inflammatory bowel disease. How, how is AI going to help us in that area? So this, Brad, is exactly where the value I believe is going to be shown. And it's the beginning of predictive abilities of AI. But if we can help you and I and others to detect better, that's a start. And we're getting there. If we can then help us to make a, in the space of what we just talked about, an optical biopsy, so a pathology determination in lifetime. So a true diagnosis here and now, that's great. If from that detection and that optical biopsy or that diagnosis, I can make a predictive call for that patient using machine intelligence, that's great. So if I can say, based on your particular type of precancerous change in the esophagus, like Barrett's esophagus, you, Mr. X, 53-year-old smoker who weighs 210 pounds, your risk is, you know, Y, come back in three years. Whereas somebody else with a similar pathology that right now I might give the same surveillance interval to, if I can individualize it because I can use all the metadata, all the imaging stuff on screen, almost like a digital biomarker. There's a particular biomarker for that patient that reflects the biology, then I can maybe individ individualize surveillance. You mentioned using drugs, so Crohn's and colitis in my space of GI. You know, we're looking for biomarkers all the time. So if I don't want to scope somebody all the time because they're having a flare of their colitis and they haven't got the energy or the time or the resources to go through regular colonoscopy, I do a stool test. It's called a fecal calprotectin. It's a measure of, it's a predictive measure often that inflammation is coming. That's what AI is going to do. Hopefully it can look at the image and the other metadata in real time or you know, in short time and say, actually, this patient is most likely to respond to this drug or not, or after six months, give up or persist. And then we're moving towards personalized drug therapy. And that's probably where the reimbursement bodies are going to get involved because they're probably going to say, if you don't do the most accurate current read of that patient's current diagnosis and their predictive outcome from that disease with this treatment, I'm not going to reimburse you because that technology exists. I think that's where it's going and where the value is going to come from AI. That's real value-based care. Right now, that whole value-based care is a bit of a moving target. And I would argue even a bit of a joke in that you have to talk to someone's leaving the emergency room with a peritonsillar abscess and you put on their, um, their summary that you spoke to them about weight loss because you're supposed to hit your score. But this sounds like real value-based care for the health system, because then it minimizes the amount of medication they need to be on. It's more like the closest we can get to a silver bullet. And at the same time, it's better, you know, it's better, lower cost, and then better for the patient. Fewer side of less medication, more, less broad spectrum, better for them in terms of side effects as well. So it's really, it sounds like a win-win. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. So is there any other way that you're using AI in gastroenterology that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, so we I briefly mentioned some of the upper GI stuff. So again, let's just say cancers throughout the GI tract, it can help. There's lots of work being done in some of the solid organs, so pancreas work, liver, whether it's with direct imaging or ultrasound or CT. Your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with the capsule endoscopy, the pill cam. That's one version that people swallow to look for Crohn's, to look for small bowel cancers, to look for bleeding. Okay, so so-called occult bleeding, where we don't know where the patient is bleeding from. It's not the stomach, it's not the colon, so we swallow a small bowel capsule camera. Those videos are hours long. They're incredibly boring. 
sitting at home in the evening after a long day reading a capsule study is not the world's most pleasant pursuit, shall we say. And there is automation now already built in from some of the groups that will direct you quickly to a bleeding site and then have you review that particular segment. Same in clinical trials. So my own group is working with one of the largest CROs in GI for inflammatory bowel disease. And we've got some technology that will take away some of the time and inefficiency for a so-called expert central reader. So right now in colitis and Crohn's, you want to put me on a certain drug, I've got to do an index colonoscopy. They don't trust the physician in the room to be accurate or objective. So they make us record the video and an expert sits at home somewhere else remotely and reads that video and says yes or no to getting into the trial. That takes 15, 20 minutes and there's reader variability. We've des devised automation AI tools that will read automatically or at the very least say to the reader, go to five minutes, 33 seconds, because that's where the most disease activity is. If you agree, next patient. If you don't agree, toggle it as you require, but it abbreviates the read. So yeah, it's already here and it's just going to, I think, increase a lot over the next several years. Are you find any, finding any resistance among your colleagues? I mean, we spoke earlier about, you know, it, there's concern that it's going to replace the physician. I think we really address that. But is there reluctance in terms of adoption? Of course there is. Absolutely. I see it this week. I'm not going to go into names of brands. It's not from our own company, but there's an AI tool in the hospital right now that's being used in my division for picking up polyps. I think it's great. It does what it says on the box. It improves polyp detection. I've already had several colleagues of mine say, oh, I don't need it. It's annoying. It's flashing in the corner. It's beeping. It just gets on my nerves. And my response to them is, well, some of my responses <laughs> things I won't say on this podcast, right? A, because I think they're being, I think they're incorrect. And B, I've got a bit of a bias and a conflict in a lot of the cases. But I challenge them and say, okay, you know what? If your adenoma detection rate is 60%, I'll agree with you. Last time I checked, it wasn't. It was, you know, 35. So you, like many of us, need some help. And if you're saying that this tool annoys you when it's helping you, then maybe the problem is with you rather than the technology. Wait, you wait, wait, wait. Adenoma detection rate is typically like 35%? Listen, there are parts of the world, Brad, and parts of the country where the ADR is maybe 10, 15, 20%. In my opinion, those people should not be scoping, but there's not a huge amount of diligence or supervision. It's a self-reporting in many parts of the world, many parts of the country. Here in BC, beautiful British Columbia, thankfully we have a provincial program that does track that to a large degree and will remind you and gently scold you that your ADR was a bit subpar. But there are plenty of places that people don't know their ADR, they, need, they don't want to know it maybe. So yeah, there's a bit of a threat, but you can't cajole people too much. You can't bash them too much with a, you know, it's a carrot and a stick. You've got to use a carrot as much as you can and show value, show clinical trials and real practice that show improvement. Not saying you suck, saying this is how you could get better. Even the best, if like, listen, if the detection rate is 50% and that's considered great, like there's still clearly a lot of room for improvement there. And so what you're saying is this is a tool that you can use not only to help you to detect, but to get better yourself at the detection. I'll give you a little anecdote. And again, I won't name names in the clinical trial space, right? So big pharma. So, you know, drug discovery, drug utilization, where one central reader in the scenario I mentioned earlier was off and the study failed this endpoint by a fraction. When they took said central reader out of the equation, the drug had met its endpoint. That was disastrous for that particular molecule and drug company, as you can imagine. The rogue reader, that happens in a daily practice, that there are rogue interpretations, or I shouldn't say rogue, but you get what I'm saying, substandard. Outlier, yeah. Right? Outliers that are very, very common in our day-to-day -day practice. Hopefully even, well, not hopefully, even in those of us who think we, we practice very well, you know, we get tired, we have bad days, we miss things, we, we're busy, we're, you know, we have far too many patients to see, a lot of pressure, so we need help. The naysayers, I get it, I think they're becoming a little bit less as we get more education out there about AI. And, you know, one of the reasons I like being on the podium is that it allows you to evangelize rather than 
eulogize too much about AI, right? But say, look, these are the pitfalls, these are the barriers, these are the issues, but these are the significant benefits, you know? Work with us rather than against us. So I wanted to end on a positive note, but I do want, since you're the first AI expert we've had on the show, there's been a lot, at least in my feed, about doomsday sayers about AI. And clearly, they're not worried about optical biopsy AI becoming a threat. But just completely unrelated to gastroenterology, what are your thoughts on the potential existential threat? Not that humanity isn't enough of an existential threat to itself, but you know the potential for existential threat of AI. Well... I'll make a general statement and then maybe relate it back to medicine. So, you know, the the concept of AGI or, art, or artificial generalized or general intelligence is enticing, but really it is quite concerning, I suppose, right? So there will have to be checks and balances because if we make machine intelligence so amazing that it can actually make autonomous decisions without our input and without our checking, that can be concerning, right? I have no idea. I'm not a true global expert in that space, but you can see that if decisions around warfare or anything else are made by machines alone, that could be a true doomsday scenario. So I think you know those concerns are real. I think there's a lot in the news about chat GBT and, and whatever, fraud and people doing their homework from chat GBT and writing their PhD theses from chat GBT. It's amazing what you can get out of it, but that is a threat as well. Okay, so I see what you're saying. You're not the concern for you, like it didn't even come up that like you're worried about it gaining consciousness and turning against it. For you, the concern is that we just don't leave it, we give it the ability to like fight fires, for instance, and it starts driving around the neighborhood, hosing down houses that are totally fine, creating damage for no reason. Like that's a you know a more benign sounding example, but that's the concern is that we just let it, or even in the case of colonoscopy, we let it completely unchecked, make all the decisions, and it suddenly we don't find out until later that things got out of hand and caused some damage. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, and one last thing maybe for your listeners is that AI in medicine can, uh, will um, improve and, uh, our inaccuracies, right? It'll make our inaccuracies less of an issue. It will also, if we train it with our biases and our inaccuracies, it will amplify those by a significant margin. So actually, if we don't train models appropriately with the wrong data, we can make bias worse. We can make access to healthcare worse for the underserved, right? So it can be a very powerful tool to improve access and equity and all that stuff, racial bias, gender bias, ethnicity bias, or it can make it worse. And there's been many examples of that. So that's the danger as well of AI, right? In medicine. Yeah, that's an excellent example. Like when I was training, dermatology was being trained on all the pictures were of lighter skin. So if that's the only data that the AI is receiving, then when they get a patient with darker skin, it's going to be an inaccurate diagnosis and those patients are going to do worse. So then that's using our own biases to inform the AI as opposed to having a wide range of skin tones when we're training it to, to detect lesions. So making sure it's free of those biases. Yeah, that's a big, that's a hot topic. You know, most models that were trained in medicine three, four, five years ago were riddled with bias, you know, overfitting very homogeneous populations and data types. So therefore, only applicable as a proof of concept, not robust to apply to our general populations with all genders and races and everything, right? And that needs to change. And thankfully, it is slowly changing. Fantastic. Well, if people want to find you, if they want to find Satisfy Health, where can we find you online? You can find us at satisfy.health, as you say, S-A-T-A, Satis, F-A-I, We'll do the we'll do the derivation on the soccer story on the next next time. Satisfied our health or Mike at Satisfied our health is how you'll find me by email or through you or through me. Hey, yeah, Dr. Brad at Physicians Guide to Doctoring. So, Mike Byrne of Satisfied Health. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And now a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit pearsonravitz.com today and embark on a journey of safeguarding your future. 
Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you. This is not a doctor-patient relationship, and this is not medical advice, or financial advice, or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.